Hello everyone, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today is October 17th, Sunday evening, and we are way behind on spooky Halloween themed paintings. So today we are going to do a watercolor la landscape painting. It'll be fast and loose, and we'll put in some spooky Gothic ruins. So in front of me, I have a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua. I am saturating this paper. I'm gonna paint wet and wet like usual. It is 140 pound cold press and it is 100% cotton. I always mention the paper that I use and mainly focus on the fact that it is 100% cotton. I really, really enjoy cotton paper. I feel that it really holds up to the wet and wet process. Um, though there's a lot of people that get away with using the Fabriano Studio, which is 25% cotton and I guess 75% alpha cellulose. Um, and they get, they're able to use it wet and wet and they're able to stretch it in the fashion that I do and not have um, too many issues. So, that is an alternative, but I don't know. I just really like this paper. This is the one that I've settled on. Anywho, let me get my palette set up and we'll jump into it. All right, so I put out some fresh paint. Just kind of um, got a few of my areas that were um, diminishing, just refilled. And if we need to add paint throughout the painting, we will. All right, so I'm using a medium hake brush and it's a Ron Ranson hake brush. A lot of people ask about it and how to achieve the te textures. And with this, it's been worn, it's been used for about three years now. And it's just a process of time and use that um, allows that to happen. Now, that being said, people ask, is there a way to kind of accelerate that wear? We explored that in some other videos on this channel. Uh, channel. And we've also played around with scratching it on sandpaper, um, trimming the edges, and we did achieve some of an effect, but I think overall just a use of the brush will eventually allow that to take place and for you to develop your own brush and your own style. So let's jump in with some raw sienna. I'm going to create my horizon line and I'm going to think of the scene. I haven't painted a gothic ruin in quite some time. I think we'll do a relatively simple one. I do have a few castle paintings up on the YouTube page and I believe there's also a video where I painted a, is it John Casper landscape painting? It might be him, but check it out. I'll have to put some links in the description below for y'all to use. I just have so many videos. I'm gonna mix in some ultramarine into this. I'm gonna mix it so we kind of get that duller gray look rather than an ultramarine sky. So remember, it's gotta be spooky. Might be John Casper Francis, John Francis Casper. Early 1800s painter, I think, out of Germany. I believe he was the one who painted Napoleon up on that mountaintop. About a year or so ago, I painted um, some Gothic ruins based off of his paintings. I'm grabbing a little bit of Payne's Gray so I could kind of darken up this area. And looking at his work was really inspiring how he achieved 
a sense of um, size of the uh, the building, how you achieved a sense of depth within the painting. I believe it's um, Cathedral Cemetery, or there there was different names that that painting was listed under. horizon here. We'll have our spire come up. He had a procession that had come out of that um, that ruin that really helps create a sense of scale. We might do some sort of funerary procession, but we want to keep it spooky. So some Payne's Gray. Just getting this initial wash. I'm going to grab some light red oxide and some ultramarine. This is a distant purple mixed in with the, um, the mud on the brush already. It's just going to create our muted background, our distant trees. I'm varying the flow of the background, varying the height of the trees to create a rhythm to it. And we could play around with the number one rigger back inside that. You want to start getting the effects of branches and trunks showing through. And now I'm making up the composition as I go along. I, I don't have any photographs on hand and I'm always wondering about like let's say pexels.com whether or not it's, even though it's kind of open source, if I could then take that, use it in a painting and overlap it on the side, I guess you'd have to see if the photographer, I don't know, explicitly, explicitly stated that you could use their art. Uh, I'm not sure how that works, but it's better to be, play things on the safer side and to respect other people's um, art. That being said, I always say that you guys are more than welcome to follow along with anything I do on this channel. You're more than welcome to sign your own name and to um, go ahead and sell said art. So I want you guys to be successful and the whole point of this channel is to explore art and help you all experiment. And at the same time, I'm experimenting and growing as well. This is some Payne's Gray on a number four rigger. It holds more pigment than the um, number one, so that's why I prefer to use it. I'm shaping out the mass of this structure. I'll kind of let it develop as I go. The struggle is going to be two things. So I'm making up this scene and what I've found with looking at uh, pictures of ruins is that they're often uneven. That one side might have more mass or density than the other side. One side may seem fuller with the other side being collapsed. So if you look online at ruins, you'll, you'll see that. Another thing is that it was very popular apparently to have fake ruins on your property in the 1800s. People just had ruins built on their property to make things, um, I, I guess it was a Gothic romantic period type deal. 
there was one story I was reading where a guy had his, I think he had a new house built right next to his old house. And then from there had holes knocked into, blown into his old house. Yeah. I, I was I was pretty surprised to read that that was a architectural fashion of the time. So a lot of those ruins are, it, well, now they'd be um, <laughs> antiques and part of antiquity, but at the time they were they were made to be fakes, I guess. The other struggle with this is gonna be the wet and wet, and you see how it's softening along those edges. I think I'll try to use that to my advantage when it dries, I'll pass over those spots, making rumble mounds. I'm just using Payne's Gray to create this scene. Now, I think an interesting diatribe, like a side story, would be to delve, delve into the fake antiquities. The fact that the fake ruins were made, and that was kind of um, in at the time. Oddly enough, I'm playing with that ortholith film with photography and taking that negative. So I'm taking that negative and I'm displaying it over um, black material to make it look like a positive image, which was a technique used in the 1800s for ambrotypes. So I'm essentially trying to recreate um, 1800 methods using more modern material. Though people do make modern ambrotypes. Let me pause the camera for a second. The cats are scratching at the door. I unfortunately have a lot of art projects in the works out and about in the art room. So I can't let the cats in at the moment, which I know bums them. And I do miss their hijinks during the, uh, the painting process. So I'm gonna have to organize everything so that they can come in and hang out. Okay, so here's some ultramarine with that raw sienna. Uh, burnt sienna, sorry. At first I was just using Payne's Gray. I'm still going wet and wet. Going to have to darken those edges, create interesting shapes for this building. Now I'm going to move away from that and start thinking about the rest of the scene. Taking that mix, just darkening a little bit of an angle here. I think a group of trees coming off the side right here will help create an idea of the depth and the height of this. Now for the trees, since we want to stay spooky, we're not going to go green or anything like that. We have some raw sienna. We could do our fall colors. We can grab some light red oxide. Now, if this were to be matted, the mat would probably come to about here, so we wouldn't see the whole thing. But personally, I paint to the edges just so the white doesn't throw me off, so that if I were to mat it, it does allow me to shift the mat around a little bit. And it just helps me create the whole scene. Some Payne's Gray over this. This classic Halloween mix of colors right there. There you go, we should do a whole painting. Light red oxide, raw sienna, Payne's Gray. That might be a good experiment. 
Like I said, I feel like we've been a little bit behind on the Halloween spirit. Okay, so we have this framing device here. We could probably pull a frame in here as well, this edge. So we open up, we come through, and we pass through, and we see it. So that is the idea of the eye. Um, we could do a procession traveling back and behind or up and through the rubble. Play around with that. Now, with these foreground trees, we still have some foliage on them. Obviously, we pretty much painted the foliage. We could take the card and scrape some textures in. We could come back later on and create some depth within it. Uh, our procession. Go back. Okay, so that being put in place, we'll do a few textural marks for a pathway. gray. You can see that we're still wet and wet back here. Now, with uh, different ruins and rubble, when I would look at them for painting purposes, there seems to be a variation in um, the surface texture of the rubble. And I'll try to articulate it where it makes sense. Where an edge might be thicker, where it might be a relief. A relief, I believe, is coming out a carving. And then it would dip in like a bowl so you'd have those edges that would have that thickness and there'd be rounded shapes or um, shallower surfaces within it. Letting the tip of the brush dance to create broken jagged edges. And one decision you want to ask yourself is how much do you want to see? The wet and wet really helps with, and I'm going to borrow a phrase from um, Mr. Stuart Davies, the illusion of detail, where it softens, it blends, and it's really just one of the magics of watercolor. I feel like magic of watercolor is a copyrighted phrase though. Um, speaking of painters, YouTube painters, there is um, Rick S who has amazing videos on um, barn paintings and building paintings on YouTube and he plays around with the wet and wet and the different textures the soft edges and the hard edges 
and use this stuff like, and I'm mixing on a little bit burnt sienna now and ultramarine, going back and forth between those two to push the variety within those wet and wet marks. And he, I think, posted today on his Facebook page that he has openings in his online classes. So I have a Patreon if you ever want to check out my page and support this channel. I do have some free content on there. But I'm not going to turn you away or uh, anything like that or um, not let you know about these artists out there that have some great um, services. Uh, Stuart Davies has his um, Zoom meetings with paintings. And um, so those are two great painters out there that are providing just awesome content. While I'm at it, um, David LaFell, it's uh, Bright Light Fine Art, I believe. He has his online classes with uh, oil painting for still lifes and um, I think portrait work. I was signed up for that for a while and I really enjoyed watching those videos and it really helped out my oil painting. I've had a book of his since I was in college and I don't know if I just looked up the book one day recently, about a year ago or so, but that inspired me to, um, to oil paint again. One of the inspirations. Taking the side of this rigger to create a dry brush effect. As you can see, uh, since we're getting that happening, we have drier areas now. So we didn't even have to do a real dry off on the uh, painting. This side brush effect is reminiscent of a technique, technique, a brush effect in Chinese brush painting. I believe it's called the axe stroke. It's a sideways dry brush that mimics the marks of, um, I guess, chopped wood or chopped grain. And it is great for stone texture. Yet another um, YouTuber, that's uh, Henry Lee, Mr. Henry Lee. And he's associated, his business is Blue Heron Arts. He has tons of videos on Chinese brush painting. I personally, I feel bad. I would watch so many painters, and there's so many amazing, helpful painters out there uh, on YouTube offering their information for free, or you know, for for money monetarily. It makes sense, um, especially people that dedicate their lives and their sole source of income to art and teaching. You know, it makes sense that they would um, you know, ask a fee for it. But personally, I don't get a chance to watch painting videos that often. Um, this is a conversation that I've had with other artists where sometimes we feel that once we start developing our own style, if we look at too many different painters at once, it does seem to have a weird impact on our painting process. Um, and I experienced that in person, and I've mentioned that before when I was in college. I originally went to Stony Brook and ta taken art classes there um, while I was doing my degrees in math and physics. And then when I came down to Louisiana, I went to UL, and I felt like the, the art culture was different there. Um, where in, and I'm not saying one's better than the other, or if they're even the same, 
how they were then as they are now. In New York, I think it was more traditional or I was in beginner classes so they were more traditional with uh, values and um, painting from uh, portraits um, from live models and then down at UL it felt more uh, conceptual art though there was a drawing class a life drawing class that I've taken I have to look up the gentleman's name he was a young guy so he's probably still teaching there but his drawing class just helped me achieve so much depth with uh, charcoal and eraser and I don't consider myself good at charcoal at, at all but just taking the class, I, I grew immensely with that. It was, it was just great. But anyway, um, the, the conceptual art side that was very prevalent in uh, the painting area kind of threw me off as at the time I was painting more impasto expressionist oil paintings. And there was more exploration of uh, shapes and splashes that were happening by others. And that, um, you know, just threw me off my game. And I took a long hiatus from creating art. I was also busy starting teaching. And anybody that, everybody knows a teacher in their life, and they know how it is. So all those things, um, coalesced into a hiatus from art. Then my inclusion teacher, who is a really good friend, um, so I have uh, students who are uh, receive special ed services and you often have an inclusion teacher that will help um, you know, um, administer services to those students. I'm going to grab some Payne's Gray. Anyway, she was talking about, um, what was it, watercolor pencil, of all things. And for some reason, I jumped into Chinese brush painting from there for a year. And then I jumped into Western watercolor painting. The great thing about Western watercolor painting and Chinese brush painting is the setup is very easy. The cleanup is very easy. At the beginning of this video, I tore my paper to get it ready right before it. And then from there, I had wet the paper, um, spritzed my palette, and I paused the camera for maybe a minute or so just to put out some other pigments that needed to be out. And when I'm done with this, all I need to do is rinse off my brushes, to be honest. So, putting a little window ideas in. I'm keeping perspective in mind, linear perspective, where this line recedes on this angle. And as we go lower in the picture plane, the angle is going to change. And then at this point, should have angles that are maybe going to start pointing up, down, more drastic, more drastic. So it's almost as if I had a string coming from an imaginary point, and I'm just rotating around that point and creating my lines. I can do the same thing here. I'll imagine my points right here. Let's, let's do this. So we'll go here. Rotate, rotate. And it's pretty lined up. I wasn't really uh, considering it or talking about it, but everything was relatively shaped well. Relatively shaped well. All right, now I'm going to play around with um, a 
procession of people. Now this procession is going to mimic the fashion of the painter that I mentioned earlier that I cannot think of the, the correct order of the name if it was John Casper, John Francis Casper, Casper Francis. I would look it up on the Kindle, but I have a timer on the Kindle right now. At the same time while filming this, I have some film stand developing. Like I said, I have a lot of projects going on at once. Hopefully they don't seem to distract from the videos. But um, I'm having this procession come up the side. still wet right here so it's kind of blurring out but I think leading to that darkest dark to that shadowy unknown within this spooky building when I was a kid Halloween was really awesome i really enjoyed it and the lead up to halloween really seemed great uh my parents were really fantastic um they would dress up too and they would help make my costumes my dad would um take this like foam skull mask so if my mom's watching this far into the video I mentioned my mom in the last one and I'm sure and so people had commented about it so thank you yeah I love my mom and she's really supportive um, my mom will probably comment and say <laughs> about this Halloween costume it was a foam rubber mask that you had to attach with like a liquid latex and then paint on top of it with like this makeup that came with it to make it look depth and detail within the, the skull and the eyes and whatnot. I think for a year or two, I had that same costume. And I remember we had it in a little container. I, that, that probably is somewhere around my parents' house still. Um, but yeah, I remember Halloween just being a big deal as a kid and unfortunately just hasn't felt like that the past few years or being an adult where we don't get trick-or-treaters ever I know my mom will on Halloween Eve the night leading into Halloween my mom will say that she ran to go get candy and then the next day she will probably tell me that unfortunately not many trick-or-treaters came by but I do feel like there will be a lot this year. Okay, I'm gonna stop for a second I'm about to talk and I'm gonna look at this corner. I'm gonna listen to Hammy through the door. Hammy, I'll be out in a minute, bud. I know. Yeah. Let's do some trees back in here very spindly not something that I do often oh poor hammy yeah I'm gonna clean up the projects in here so that he can come in let's cast a shadow we'll come out from here I'm not really looking at directions of my shadows on a little bump, on a little mound. Okay, so I was talking about Halloween 
and I feel like this year hopefully it might be bigger for the kids where obviously with you know lockdowns etc you know with things people are getting um, antsy and numbers are going down in Louisiana which is good um, I'm not sure the state of this second uh, sorry the the booster shot the third one is I know I had gotten mine I was eligible in I think in May or April I got it, but they only opened it up to people in the month before that, so we'll find out. Anyway, with that being said, I think Halloween will hopefully be bigger for the kids. They do do some stuff this year where they'll have businesses set up, and um, kids will, and this is past years too, they'll trick or treat to different businesses. They will also do it where They set a certain time frame and parents will go around with the kids during that time frame and trick-or-treating will be between those hours. I don't know if that's common. Like I said, I grew up in New York and I don't recall that. So if anybody remembers or if they've noticed a change in hours and trick-or-treating and stuff like that, let me know. Let's darken one up back here. I'll we'll bring it a little bit closer. So what I'm doing here is creating a tree that's sitting between our foreground and our midground and our kind of far midground. So we get a curvature and a brush being thrown. A sense of depth back here. You can play with this as much as you want. And of course, if you follow along, I'd love to see your results. I have a whole bunch of different social media links down below. Feel free to uh, follow me on Instagram, show me your work. I'll check your stuff out too. Okay, let's pause it. We'll do a dry off. Now, while I was drying, of course, I thought we need a little cemetery action. I think that'll help. Create this and we'll also put a cross up here. And I'll pause and do one last dry off. All right, really cool. I'm very happy with this one. I don't know if I mentioned, I feel like I've been a little bit in an art funk or kind of all over the place art wise. Um, probably just a lot of experiments at once and not so much um, any finished results. But hanging out, telling stories, and anticipating Halloween was quite fun. So I'm gonna pull the camera out. And we'll see how it looks underneath the mat. There you go. Our spooky Halloween ruins. I hope you all enjoyed. Um, and you all stay safe and have fun. Take care.